I would say that, but I, I know better. Uh, my wife and I walk into a cafe and, and I say bonjour and I order a cafe creme and they answer me in English because they know I'm American. Uh, they can tell from the way I say it. And, and that, of course, in Europe you know this because in Europe you know that uh, someone who speaks three languages is, is trilingual and someone who speaks two languages is bilingual and someone who speaks one language. So, so the ugly American learns swift. Well, I think about this here in Paris, just such a beautiful city, but the ugly American passes cafe after cafe after cafe looking for coffee and instead, <laughs> and then they're hungry and they pass restaurant after restaurant serving great food and they stop it. But this, this isn't what makes the ugly American ugly. What makes the ugly American ugly is they go back home and someone says, how is the food, how is the coffee in Paris? And they say, eh, about the same. <laughs> so of course, not all Americans are ugly Americans, and not all ugly Americans are actually Americans. Some are, are European. The, the crowd turns. There's a very famous story by Herman Hesse called The European that comes from his collection, If the War Goes On, and he talks about after a great war where Europeans have basically blown up the world and it's sort of a post-World War Noah's Ark comes and it picks up all the animals and it picks up Africans and Chinese and it stops and it picks up a European and while everybody else is working together to build something, the European keeps to himself and does his writing and does his thinking. And everyone else is sharing. Someone is growing crops and someone is fishing and someone, everyone is doing something. And the European is doing what he does best. He's criticizing. <laughs> and so they say to him, well, what do you do? What's your special gift? And he says, it's my intellect. That's my special gift. And they say, well, that's great. Show us. Show us this intellect. Calculate something for us. And they pose this problem for him. And before he's thought of it, someone else has shouted out the answer. And he says, well, calculation, that's not intellect. That's not what I'm talking about. So they say, OK, so what is this intellect? Can you show it to us? He says, well, there's actually nothing to see. See, intellect is in my head. I store up images of the outside world, and from these images, I make things for myself. <laughs> right? Sound familiar? We criticize, and then we sit around and we make things for ourselves. Um, in this story, I should note, the European was not very well liked. So uh, as Sylvain mentioned, I was coding in Objective-C before the iPhone. And in those days, it was an interesting world because there weren't very many of us, and we were spread out. But in those days, we found each other. We found connections. And in those days, it was a really nice community. It was very friendly. People would help each other with things. People didn't sit around and criticize. And then iPhone 2 was released, and we could write apps for the iPhone. And all of a sudden, our world got very crowded. And us old timers looked for each other, and we could find each other here and there, but it was harder to talk to each other because there was all these new people here. And the new people, some were very good and wanted to learn this new world, and some were like the ugly American learning objective C. And by ugly American, by and large, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and they would say to us, And they said, well, we want code to look like this. And why can't you send a message to four? And we would say, what are you doing here? You don't like anything we do. You want us to change everything. What are you doing here? And they say, well, this is where the money is. We want to build apps for the iPhone, the iPad. And we've heard there's an Apple Watch coming. And I think of that as being someone who loves Paris, but they go to drink here and they go to eat here. If you go to a country, you embrace that country. And if you go to Objective C, you embrace Objective C. And even though we are in a swift love fest here today, 
Objective-C is a wonderful language. There are wonderful things we can do with it. There's dynamism. Square brackets. They aren't as scary as you think. I think of them as a warm hug around the receiver and the message we send it. So I send you the message to do this. And it's up to you whether you do or not. So other than square brackets, which aren't as frightening as they, they might seem, here's the frightening part of Objective-C, the colons. And if you think one argument looks bad, try to explain to a newcomer what this is. And once they get this, try to explain to them what this is instead of true and false. <laughs> and the Rubius says, why? And we have two words for them as an answer. The one word is history. And one thing we had with Objective-C that we don't have with Swift is we had 20-some years of history. And so we could explain to the Rubius when they say, well, why don't you have new? We can say, we do have new. And when the Rubius said, well, then why do you use alloc init? We can explain that at some time, it became important to us to separate these two phases, this phase where we allocate memory and where we initialize our object. And for the most part, people would specialize the init phase, but they would leave the alloc phase alone. And so there were reasons for the things that we did. But that's not what we told Rubius. When they asked us questions like this, we would tell them. <laughs> but we had rich patterns. We had patterns that I still love. We had delegates. We had a different way of thinking of nil. How many talks today have had to explain optionals? In the old days, you send a message to nil. If no one's there, they don't answer. When did you own an object? It was this simple. If you created it with new, alloc, retain, or copy, you own the object. And if you owned an object, the rule was you had to release it. And you either release it now or you released it later. And then, for those of you that didn't join us until the iPhone, we got modern Objective-C. And you wouldn't believe what a commotion this little guy caused. <laughs> when we got properties and people used dot syntax, we heard, oh, you're just a bunch of Java-loving wannabes and you self-hating the dot syntax. And later we got blocks and retain became strong, and then this brilliant innovation of weak. It changed our code completely, because when a view went away, we didn't have to release all of its buttons and labels. Weak just meant if the view wasn't there to hold onto it anymore, all these little components went away too. And this was wonderful. And what a lot of us didn't know then was we were seeing the beginnings of Swift, that Arc was invented for Swift. And even though it helped our objective C code and it changed our lives with iOS 5, iOS 5, they were already working towards Swift. So when people say it's a new language we haven't seen, well, yes, but they've been thinking about the implications of it for an awfully long time. We watched our header files with our outlets and our actions shrink. And once they shrank, we needed another place to put our outlets and our actions, and all of a sudden, the private interface, the class extension became important, and our outlets lived there, and our actions lived in the .m file, and they were private. Nobody needed to know about them. And then there was a little icing on the cake. We got storyboards and auto layout, and they told us auto layout was for localization because they didn't want to tell us we were going to get another size iPhone, and you had to support both of them. And then delegates got pushed to the side, and they started saying, use blocks. Use closures, and I wept. Objective-C had come so far in the last four years. It had changed so much. It had lost a lot of the dynamism. We didn't use ID anymore for a lot of our widgets that we're connecting to with outlets. We used actually UI button and UI label. And we were getting ready for Swift. And so instead of our header file and our .m file, our worlds came together in our single .swift file. 
And now that we didn't have our header, how do we let people know what they're allowed to use? Now we needed access control. We had to say, well, this is public. Anybody can see this. And this is private, but private doesn't mean what you think it does. Private is to this file. It's not to this class. And then the word that nobody types, our default case, our internal case. And we had classes, but boy, we'd always had classes. Now we had structs. And I don't mean like an NS rect. I don't mean like a CG point. We had structs that were really important. And all of a sudden, we were supposed to favor structs over classes. And we we're supposed to favor them, as you heard earlier today, because class instances were passed by reference and structs are passed by value. And all of a sudden, we couldn't see the difference anymore because we'd lost our asterisk. Again, a very sad moment for me. Enumerations came along, and enumerations, as you've seen twice today already, very important, and protocols saying, you know what? Subclassing is dangerous. And now I've got structs and enums and classes, and I need to be able to somehow say I'm following some sort of a contract. And so saying that I inherit an interface and not an implementation is so important. And so we started working with protocols in Swift more. And then if you write any blog post on Swift, you've got to put angle brackets in or they won't let you publish it. <laughs> and so you have to include generics. Now we have to store state, even though it's supposed to be immutable and things are supposed to change, and so we need variables. But this occurred to someone. They said, you know, most of our variables, we only set the value once. Once we've set the value, it's a constant. Let's make it let. And let became huge. Let over var, structs over classes. We don't send messages anymore, we invoke functions. That's something we haven't done in an awfully long time. Functions, very important. And as you heard earlier, functions are closures. Every function is a closure, blocks are just central to what we're doing. And functions everywhere. I mean everywhere. No, no, everywhere. And all of a sudden, we started writing code like the Rubyists wanted us to. We could even send messages to the number four, because four is an instance of a struct. It's not a primitive anymore. Our world is just ending around us. And we got map, and filter, and reduce, and that wasn't enough for functional programmers. They wanted us to talk about category theory, but that's less important than you think. What I want you to think about, what we mainly gain out of Swift, is we get code that we can reason about. We can look at the code and see the parts that change, and we can see the parts that don't change, and we get code that we can reason about. They've just done a wonderful job. So there's a classic story about the blind men and the elephant. And the blind men walk up to the elephant, and each one has a different experience. And one touches the side and says an elephant is a wall. And one touches his trunk and says an elephant's a tree branch. And they touch different parts of the elephant, and they come to different conclusions. With Swift, we all come from different backgrounds. Some of us come from, oh, I don't know, Objective-C, or Java C Sharp World, or Ruby, or Haskell. And each of us come to this new language with our own biases. Whether we come from object-oriented programming, or functional programming, or generic programming, wherever we come from, we come with biases. But here's something that's different. We have to confront that we are the ugly American. Because we come to Swift and we say, it's not what I expected. As the blind men walked up to the elephant, they each said nice things. But here in Objective-C, they come and go, you know these things I've always done in Objective-C? They're hard now. This Swift, I don't know about it. And the people that come to us from Haskell, they say, well, it's not really as functional as I want. It's just not Haskell. And everybody comes with their own complaints. And they tell Apple, just fix this little one thing for me, and then I'll like Swift. And so while the elephant whispers come up and they say, ah, it's a wall, it's a rope, it's something I recognize, each one of the language whispers come up and say, you know what, it isn't. 
Haskell. It isn't Objective-C. It isn't something that I want. So if we think of Herman Hesse's European and think back to his special gift, his special gift is in his head, he stores up images of the outside world, and then from these images, he makes new images and systems. And that's what we're doing. With Swift, we put all these different concepts. It's not about structs. It's not about classes. It's about the apps that we're building for the people around us. And so as we begin on this road, I mean, Swift went final in September. That's not many months ago at all. And so together as a community, we need to figure out how does Swift work best? Now, the end of the European story was not happy. Nobody really liked the European. And they went to Noah and they basically said, can't we get rid of this guy? And Noah says, yeah, actually, I, I asked about this. And it was explained to me that everybody on this boat has a mate except the European, and the European is not going to be able to perpetuate himself unless he can get along with others, unless he can draw from each of these different communities, just like we do with our new language. So we need to look at that. The elephant story ends in two different ways. It's a story told in a lot of different cultures. And in one set of cultures, the end of the elephant story is everybody fights. And they say, no, it's a wall. No, you're an idiot. It's a rope. And they beat each other up. In the other version of the story, someone outside of them or among themselves, they come to realize that actually they've got different views of the same thing. And they can't look at it this way, but if they step back just a tad, they realize they have something really powerful in their hands. And that's what we have with Swift. If we mine what we get from the OO community and from the functional community, really brilliant people that have thought about coding in each one of these paradigms, and we think of what we have mixed together in Swift, we've got so much power. And so we work together to figure out just how to work with Swift. And we build these great apps and systems because Swift is a top to bottom language. And we delight our customers. And we create code that we can reason about. Thank you.